All right, welcome to this episode of the Grow Podcast. My name is John King. I'm the host of the agronomy portion of the podcast. You know, as usual, we're going to dive into what's happening in the fertilizer and chemical markets. Um, as uh, we've had a ton of volatility in the last 60 days that a lot of people have obviously seen. You know, if anybody with Twitter or uh, in on any kind of ag talks, if, if there's been a lot of talk about the volatility in the market. Um, we're then going to transition a little bit more to discuss about what we're doing here at Landis from a lot of our uh, facility upgrades, a lot of what we're doing with, you know, looking at the the plant or the local facility of the future to service the farmer, um, whether it's our brand new Mitchellville facility, our liquid shed at Rake that we're building, or our new to come um, Boone manufacturing plant. So, you know, that's really what we're going to focus on here today. Uh, no product of the month, and unfortunately Dan's out, so we won't have the, the man, uh, Dan the man on with us today. But um, we're really going to dive in more today and talk about the business side of what's happening in the agronomy business. So, you know, when you look at kind of starting off on the fertilizer side, when you look at what's happened in the market, the market the last 60 days has been transitioning uh, down, you know, fairly significantly. I'm sure most of you have kind of seen that in your local retail market. Um, you know, and really the reason behind that is, and I've talked about it a lot on the podcast, um, you know, for those of you that made it to the Grill Rewards trip in Florida, Josh. Linville, who was down there and presented on the fertilizer markets, did a good job talking about it. But, you know, we we really put prices to a point from a high side, you know, the old adage, high prices cure high prices. Well, it finally did it globally. And it got to the point where we really killed um, global prices due to the fact that the prices were too high. Not only was it not affordable for the U.S. farmer, but the Brazilian farmer, um, Latin America, across the globe, it got to a point where people really rationed demand. Um, when you look back to the market, November, December timeframe, we saw a lot of high prices due to this fear of what was going to happen in Europe um, due to low gas supply, due to uh, Russian interference of overall gas supply. And that was really restricting what the outlook of the fertilizer market was going to be. Um, you know, fast forward to today. We've had probably some of the highest, most unnatural weather trends in Europe um, that we've seen in recent history. They've had one of the most mild winters um, in recent history, which really, really helped them um, preserve their gas supply, maintain domestic production, and really eliminate them from being huge buyers in the market. Um, when you look back to the fall, when we had nitrogen prices running up drastically, um, you know, a lot of that was due to the fact that the European buyers we're buying an extreme amount of urea, UAN, ammonia in the market um, because they couldn't simply manufacture it due to 60 to $90 natural gas prices. Um, you know, what, what happened at that point when you have 60 to $90 natural gas prices, the LNG market, they were soaking up every bit of LNG they possibly could because of the drastic difference in prices. Um, today, you know, obviously with the lack of extreme heating needs for natural gas, gas a lot of their production has stayed running um, throughout the winter because uh, prices uh, prices on natural gas have gotten to a point that allows them to produce in the market. So, I mean, that really is the main driver from the nitrogen side that we've seen really push prices lower. Um, I'd also say, you know, most of the market, um, you know, on the international side or domestically has been waiting for India to tender for urea. That finally came to fruition um, this week where they have announced that they are going to tender urea. Um, however, you know, to some dismay, it's it's a lot less product than what the rest of the world thought they were going to need, um, especially with being out of the market for almost two months. Um, you know, most of the people in the global urea trade have been waiting for them to tender for urea for two months. Um, it's never come forward. And now that it's finally come forward and it's only for a, a small nominal amount of volume, um, that's really kind of put people back on the side of saying, well, you know, what's the hope for higher prices? You know, when I look at it domestically for, you know, overall nitrogen prices uh, to where they've kind of fallen to, you know, there's not much more downside. There could be more upside than downside, primarily due to logistics. You know, you're going to have people that are, don't, have, not, have been afraid to carry inventory, um, primarily because, you know, it's been devaluing. So there's not going to be as much local supply. Um, when I look at our inventories here at Landis, especially on the dry P and K side, we don't have it sold. We don't have it stat. We do not have it sitting. I'm taking the stance that if we, if we don't have it sold, we can't take the risk uh, for our members to 
for the de devaluation that's going to be coming to the market. So, um, you know, really when you look at that across the board, um, everybody in retail has had the same kind of mindset um, where they're not willing to take inventory risk, fill their sheds and be ready for spring application. So therefore, everybody else that's resellers in the market have essentially, um, you know, gone away from pricing stuff at high. They're trying to find ways to get to spur demand both at retail and at the grower level. And, you know, for a lot of people that are listening, um, you know, that probably have spring application yet to do, you know, a lot of them, a lot of people from our side we're looking at it haven't really pulled the trigger yet. Um, now, when I look to the spring of 23, especially as it relates to dry P and K, um, you know, there's really not much more to hold out on. You know, when you look at the prices today, you know, you're probably mid to low 700s on phosphates. Um, potash just got a five in front of it, probably in the mid 500s. Um, you know, there's not a ton of, a ton more downside when you really look at the weather outlook. Um, the weather outlook, the next 20 days is fairly favorable for application. Um, we've gotten a little snow across Iowa here this past week, but um, when you look at, call it 20 or 30 south, uh, it's pretty bare ground. Um, we're going to be able to be out there spreading here in a, about another week. Um, so overall, you know, the market has been in a real transition standpoint from when uh, application stopped in December and now where we're getting to the point where March 1st is coming and we're going to put, some, we're just going to start putting stuff down to the ground. I fully expect for that to stop. Um, prices on dry P and K are not going to keep looking for a new price to create demand because demand is naturally going to be created from the time that, from the time of year that we're at. So, you know, when you really look at it, if you've got dry P and K that you need to be booking or you need to be planning, you know, I would say spend the next, you know, two weeks before, you know, things really start with your local supplier and really look to get that covered, have a plan together, understand what you're going to do on those acres. Um, because the, the overall amount of downside the next 30 to 60 days is virtually zero. Um, you know, on UAN and Urea, my personal opinion is there's more upside in the next 30 days than there is downside. We've kind of reached a point where um, prices have done a lot of work to the downside. Um, when you look at overall the global trends that are coming at us for um, – really what's going to happen here domestically. Domestically, from a urea standpoint, we need to be a big importer of urea the next three months. Um, we're way behind our import, uh, export debt uh, supply. And the only way that we're going to really get caught up on that is we're going to have to be the main buyer of urea domestically. Uh, now, when you look at that, the reason we haven't been is because the people that import urea have been afraid of the price risk because there's been no demand from retail or from farmers. So, you know, in order for that, for them to really go out and take the risk, there's going to have to be somebody that's, you know, really pulling that demand forward. And I think we're kind of getting there. But at the end of the day, you know, if I'm in a grower's shoes today and I know I'm going to do pre-plant UIN and pre-plant urea, uh, now is kind of the time. There's really not a whole lot more of the downside that you're going to see that's going to drastically affect your net cost per acre. Um, my guess is too, is as you look at retail, as we get into, you know, April 1st with busy applications, prices aren't going to change in season. Um, so, you, you know, now's your time to really work with your local retailer or work with your supplier on, you know, what's my cost look like, what's the opportunities and, and try to get that booked and ready to go. Um, on the ammonia front, I would say look to be booking ammonia in the next 15 days. Um, there's been an announcement here this morning that the Tampa contract between Mosaic and Yara uh, basically uh, settled $200 lower than what February was. So we're really getting to a point on ammonia that from a cost per acre standpoint, it is very, very, very appetizing. You know, I think ammonia is going to continue to reset lower as we get into the summer. But for now, I really believe that you know, ammonia has gotten to a point where uh, over the next 15 days, it's going to be a great opportunity for growers to look to lock in. Um, I know here at Landis, we've, uh, we've really looked to, you know, more or less price ourselves to current market. Um, so make sure that you're working on that, uh, as you look for your new acres here, um, this spring. Okay. So one thing I really want to kind of give everybody a perspective for today, as well as kind of an outlook to fall of 23, you know, last fall 23, when I was sitting here a year ago, honestly, about this time. 
you know, we were just kind of kicking off the Ukrainian and Russian war. Um, that created a high amount of inflation instantly in the global market uh, for prices on fertilizer, potash, phosphate, ammonia, a lot of the products that were produced in either Belarus, Russia, or Ukraine. Fast forward a year from now, instead of having the conversation around, I see a ton of upside in the market, I see a ton of downside through the summer, okay? So uh, not that you're going to see that downside in the next 30 days when you're about ready to apply it because it's a kind of a captive market situation. Um, when you're going to see it is May, June, July, okay? That's when the market is really going to look to transition from where we are today to getting the farmer interested in fall fertil fertilizer, fall ammonia, and planning for the uh, the next year's crop. So when you look at that, you know, kind of cobbling with what we saw in Europe for overall um, natural gas supplies, you know, Europe today has the highest amount of natural gas in inventory that it's had in five years. It's not getting colder there the next few months. It's going to get warmer. So what that means is they're going to have opportunity this summer to replenish their natural, their natural gas storage and really get themselves in a good spot for next winter. Um, when you think about that, that is pretty bearish nitrogen products as we enter the summer, okay? Um, so when we look toward next year on fall prepay ammonia, UAM prepay for spring of 24, those prices are going to be um, significantly more favorable than what we've seen the last two years. Um, I'm thinking, I think I started with Landis in 2020. It's not going to be as good as that. But I would say uh, the fall of 21, very comparable prices, okay? Um, and a lot of that is primarily due to the fact that we're going to have pretty good natural gas supplies in Europe. Um, and overall, energy globally is going to be um, more well supplied. It's like anything. No different than fertilizer, high prices, cure high prices. The energy market's the same scenario. Now, with all this being said, anything can happen on any given day. Um, there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of global headlines on the Chinese a lot of global headlines still on, you know, the further escalation of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. So depending on what happens there, um, you know, anything can change at an instant. But from where I sit today um, and looking forward, there's going to be an opportunity for the U.S. farmer um, to really position himself for, you know, cost-effective inputs as we look to the 24 crop. Uh, you know, when I look at what those prices could be, you know, fall ammonia of 23 could be somewhere between 650 to 800 and you know, i know that's a pretty big gap but you know quite a different scenario from where we've been at today um you know you could be looking at UA uam prepay in the low 300s to high 200s um you know call it i don't think it's going to be 250 i don't think it's going to be 275 but could it be 290 to 350 somewhere around there is is very likely um, just from what I'm seeing, um, both globally and what's happening in Europe already for reset prices, um, as well as some of the, you know, as what it looks like we're going to transition to what, to summer uh, urea and UAN levels. Um, when you're looking at P and K, you know, I expect retail phosphates to be in the 600s, and I expect uh, retail potash to be somewhere in the 400s. So you look back a year ago, again, at this point, we were looking toward the fall of 23, we had $1,000 phosphates, and we had $800 potash. So, you know, when you're starting to look at, you know, what are your soil tests telling you? What are your opportunities for this fall telling you? You know, there's going to be an opportunity this fall to look at building soil levels on P and K. There's going to be an opportunity this fall to um, have some cost-effective nitrogen prices. So I think the important thing is, uh, as a grower of tomorrow, somebody that's looking forward to not only this growing season, but having to look past that, you know, as you get this crop in the ground, um, you start getting everything sprayed, you get to early summer, mid summer, there's going to be opportunities to work with your local retailer on a prepay basis and really find yourself some, some cost of, uh, effective uh, values for fall of 2023. You know, and with that, you know, I think the important part of that is, you know, understanding, you know, who works, who you work with, um, what they can bring to you and, and, and really the information that you're getting, um, you know, information is almost as powerful as a day-to-day -day price right now. Um, you know, 60 days versus today is quite a bit different. And honestly, today versus um, 120 days from now is going to be quite a bit different as well. So um, continue to work with your local retailer, especially us at Landis on what that looks like for your overall fertilizer supply as we get through this spring 
and then as we look toward um, next fall for overall affordability. You know, kind of transitioning to chemicals, um, you know, the fertilizer market's been under pretty significant pressure. I would not say that the chemical market has been under the same kind of pressure. Um, however, when I look at the chemical market, it's going to be very important uh, for the U.S. farmer, especially the farmers that have been spraying their own products uh, and have carried some inventory. You know, I've worked with a lot of different growers across the nation here that um, both the Midwest and in different parts of the U.S. and especially here in Iowa that you know, they spray for themselves. They have inventory. They carry over inventory from last year due to tight supplies. I'm not saying that supplies won't remain somewhat tight, but overall tech AI prices out of China as you look forward to the summer are coming off pretty drastically. So your glyphosate products, your glufosinate products, um, clethodones, dicambas, all those products are going to get back into a more competitive sphere as we enter the summer months. What the base manufacturers do with that is yet to be determined, but you know, I think it's important for everybody to that has inventory that's locked in their inventory for the spring, make sure that it is, uh, you're, you're sizing your inventory for what you're actually going to use this, this spring and this summer. Um, it's not going to be relatively important to carry those products year over year. Like we've seen in past years, it's going to be more important to make sure that we, you as the grower are completely empty coming out of this summer and you're positioning yourself to, uh, purchase a good amount of your crop, uh, protection products next fall. Uh, for for spring of 24. Um, you know, I know when I look at our company here at Landis, that's exactly what we're doing. Our goal is to end empty, have very little inventory. Um, obviously, there's some stuff we'll have to have in order to service the, our, our growers, but um, in general, we're not looking to be, you know, wildly long in the market. Um, some products that I would really, you know, caution everybody on them being tight are your granular insecticides, your Aztecs, especially your Aztec products, those are few and far between. Um, you know, just the process and the AIs that are a part of that product um, from a production standpoint, it's it's very complicated and it is hard to get a hold of right now. So um, I know we've had drastic cuts in our overall supply from an annual basis and the entire market has. So, um, you know, if, if you're a grower out there and you have a granular insecticide system on your planter, you don't have anything purchased yet, be mindful of that. Be working with your local retailer on what options there are. Uh, Syngenta's Force product is, is still readily available, though it is quite a bit more expensive, but it is something we can still get today. Um, that is something that is a huge priority. And if, if I'm a grower today and I don't have those products secured, make sure you're looking to get them secured. The other market is the premium fungicide market. The premium fungicide market is extremely tight. So when you look at those, that's and, and we've been talking about this one for a long time, okay? So when you look at those, it's the Valtimas, your Trivapros, your Mirabis, um, your Revtex, Delero Complete. Um, those products today are in extremely tight supply due to what I would say is the the drastic, um, maybe not drastic, drastic may not be the right word, but the overall understanding of what tar spot can do to your crop, um, especially with what we saw last year here in Iowa. Uh, we've had a lot of growers come to us plan for their fungicide applications in greater detail than what we've had in the years past. Um, today at, at Landis alone, we're sitting up probably about 30% versus what we sold all of last year on fungicides. So that's 30% more than what we sold all of last year today on contract. So, you know, when you look at what Tar Spot did to a lot of those crops, um, for those of you that follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you know, we've had some videos out there talking about Tar Spot especially in some of the areas where we saw anywhere from 25 to 30 bushel differential on what didn't get applied. You know, the a lot of our customer base has already been planning on what that application looks like, guaranteeing supply, and so on and so forth. So um, again, if you haven't put a plan together on a premium fungicide brand, you know, especially Driver Pro, Miravis, Valtima, RevTech, Delero Complete, be doing that today um, because those products, by the time we get to June, will likely be in extremely tight supply if not sold out. There are other options to look at. Um, there are some some good options um, from some of the post-patent companies uh, that we will have in pretty good supply. Um, but again, as everything continues to get consumed, everything's going to get tight, whether it's the premium stuff or the post-patent stuff. You know, as product in general is getting bought um, at a rapid pace, those things will, too will, will tighten up. So be making sure that you're working with either us here at Landis on what you need or, or whoever is your local supplier. 
Okay, kind of transitioning to uh, the outlook on the projects that we're doing here at Landis from an agronomy standpoint. You know, this is something obviously I'm I'm heavily involved in and and thoroughly enjoy um, because it's really looking at what are what kind of company are we going to be for the future to service the American farmer, especially one that continues to outpace uh, speed, space, growth, all those things. So I want to highlight three primary projects that we've been working on. Um, one of uh, two of them are kind of coming to a close. And the, the one is about to just begin. But uh, obviously, I posted it on my Twitter um, back this fall when we were kind of finishing up, buttoning up our Mitchellville facility. And we will have uh, some updated videos those of that facility here in the next few weeks when it's fully uh, completed uh, on the inside for the chemical building uh, for everybody to see. But, uh, you know, obviously, the, the fertilizer buildings there are completely completed. It's an 8,000-ton shed. Um, we have Sackett uh, Waconia blenders in it it's very fast very efficient facility um and that's been operating since october this fall um when we transition to the the liquid facility at mitchellville um that's probably what i'm most excited about for all of our new projects coming is really an emphasis on what our liquid capabilities are from both a bulk fertilizer and bulk chemical standpoint to service the farmer from a speed from a speed standpoint so um our mitchellville facility is going to be 24 7 uh, automation for both chemical and fertilizer. So as long as it's in a bulk tank or it's in our uh, on one of our tote racks at Mitchellville, we're going to be able to fully service the farmer of tomorrow 24-7 at that facility. Um, and a lot of people are going to be scratching their heads wondering, well, how do you ensure there's no contamination? How do you ensure uh, that it's getting loaded right? Um, with technology, the way it's advancing and the way that you fund these facilities, we call it direct injection. So we are literally injecting the chemical into the line, the order sequence it needs to be injected in, along with either the water carrier or, 30, or, or fertilizer carrier at the same time. Um, with that, you get a really consistent blend into the truck and it's extremely efficient. So when you look back to what uh, retail's been doing for probably the last 10 to 15 years, a lot of it's been weigh tubs where you, know, you dump one chemical product in, rinse it, weigh it, and inject it into the truck. This is um, all done by mass flow meters. Um, so it's extremely, extremely precise as well as extremely fast. So, you know, at our Mitchellville facility, we'll be able to, um, you know, our, our big pumps are going to load 32 or water at about 450 gallons per minute to 550 gallons per minute. Um, we'll be able to load, um, our chemical products into, um, the line at 50 gallons per minute. You know, thinking about that, there's not a whole lot of products that we're going to use, you know, even at. 50 gallons for the entire field or for the entire mix. So, you know, our goal there is we're able to get a truck in, load it, and move it out of the, out of the bay within six to seven minutes. Um, industry standard, I'm not sure what it is, but to me, um, that's a lot of juice we can move in a pretty short amount of time. Um, also with the facility, we'll have two bays. Um, so one bay will be 24-7 access for farmers to come pick up hot loads uh, or just bulk fertilizer products, um, you know, at any point of the day or night. Um, then we'll have one inside bay that will be more so, um, you know, hands-on. We'll have staff there to to load your trucks, work with you on that. So as long as you're coming in at normal business hours or um, when we're open for in-season, um, there'll be somebody there to help you. So um, we'll have some pictures and some videos on our YouTube page, our Instagram page, all of our social media here in the next few weeks to kind of really highlight that. Um, but I would be definitely looking out for that um, in the next few weeks to kind of see what that facility looks like because... It is really a world-class, beautiful facility. Um, transitioning, we're also building a very similar building at Rake, Iowa. Um, we've got, we're gonna have an 18,000 square foot facility for both chemical fertilizer, liquid fertilizer and seed. Um, at Rake, it's at basically at our existing, it's right at our existing facility there today, just north of where we used to have our liquid loadout. Um, that completion, um, just due to the weather and the, the issues up there um, with the winter, um, we're looking for a June 1 start date for that uh, facility to be, to be completely fully automated. You know, really, when you look at that, it's going to have the same ability as Mitchell. It's going to be 24-7 access for two lanes on bulk chemical and bulk fertilizers. Um, you know, it's going to be an extremely fast and efficient facility. And it's one that we're really looking forward to um, having in our arsenal up there where we have a, a really great business and appreciate everybody's business. And finally, the project that I want to highlight, um, that's something to look forward to, you know, you know, not only as a local landis farmer, but also anybody that farms throughout the Midwest, is our Boone Repack and Manufacturing Facility. 
We're in the final stages of development on that facility um, and, and will be operational hopefully by spring of uh, March 1 of 24. Um, but what that facility is going to do is it's going to have 400,000 gallons of bulk storage for chemical. It's going to have about 200,000 gallons of storage for bulk fertilizers. And it's going to have a 25-ton liquid blender uh, that we're going to be able to use to manufacture our own adjuvants, foliars, starters, PGRs, and on down the line. Um, what that does for us here in Landis that we believe is it's going to give us a ton of um, ability to make products for growers that are really honed in on their um, what works on their farm. Um, for instance, you know, if there's certain um, types of a foliar product that you really think is going to be more um, acceptable for your for your farming operation, um, we can custom blend and make some of those products for you there. We will have a standard products that we're going to make and sell under the lab Landis label, but um, we'll also be able to custom blend stuff that y you would need. It, it also goes the same way on starters. So we're going to have a ability to make our own starters, um, uh, either an 80-10 ortho poly or a 50-50 ortho poly, and potentially even 100% ortho, uh, ortho phosphate products there. Um, we're going to be able to make those on demand in bulk for whatever you would want. We can add different micro packs. Um, we're going to have some standard micro packs that we're going to sell. But again, what it really does is it allows us at Landis to look at the broader market of what's coming from a foliar standpoint, the technologies that are going to be implemented into foliar products, and provide our farmers with solutions um, that are a little bit more consistent with what they need. When you look at the people that are selling starters, foliars, whatever it may be today, um, a lot of that is you know the distribution companies, the Lovelands, uh, Winfields of the world, and they don't have the flexibility to provide a, a main skew for a small amount of acres. You know, they have to look at developing products that can fit on a wide range of acres. And that's both good and bad. Um, it's good for a lot of people that don't have the ability to put a blending facility in. But, you know, when we look at it, we're going to be able to have a little bit more intimate conversation around what does that crop need on your acres to really grow and maximize a uh, yield return. And then we'll be able to provide you, provide the farmer with a solution on a custom blend or one of our basic, it's going to have about 70,000 square foot of warehouse space. That would include where the bulk tanks are going to sit as well as the blender. Um, but when we look at that, you know, this facility will be able to service basically a five state territory. Um, you know, we're going to continue to work with our focus on the farmers in our local trade area, but you know, we're also going to be open up to business with farmers all across the Midwest on what they may need. And we definitely encourage anybody that doesn't know about Landis or hasn't heard of us, you know, reach out to us. Have a conversation with our Grow Solutions Center at 515-800-GROW about what you may need. Um, you know, long term, that's going to be something we're going to be able to provide uh, on a very um, localized, personalized uh, opportunity. With that, that's all the good news I have for today. Um, I appreciate everybody uh, tuning in and listening um, and, and providing us uh, the opportunity to, to give you guys this information and do business with you. Again, um, for anything or any questions you may have, please reach out to us at 515-800-GROW. Um, we're more than willing to answer your questions on some of the comments that I made today. And somebody within the Growth Solutions Center will get you in contact with me at any time. Again, thank you for your business and thank you for support of Landis. Have a great day.